Excellent. So, um, my name is Anna. I um, work with Salman and Travis at Microsoft. I'm going to talk today about um, spatial analysis for flood, flood relief, how we get data, some basic analytics we can do on that data um, to prioritize response to disaster. So, just a little bit about me. I've been working over six years at Microsoft on geospatial products and more broadly for around eight years I've been working in GIS. Um, in my spare time I really liked to um, work like this uh, with disaster response. I've done work uh, on communications response after Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria uh, in the Caribbean as well as food bank uh, distribution in my own home. So uh, I always look for opportunities where we can use GIS to help solve real problems because that's what GIS is all about. Now if you don't know what GIS is, that's okay. We're going to start from the beginning. Um, Geographic Information Systems is what that stands for. Some people also uh, use the same acronym, Geographic Information Science. Basically, this is system and science um, around capturing geographic information, storing it, displaying it, and analyzing it. So um, you're all probably familiar with this through, you know, Bing Maps, Google Maps, our navigation apps. This is all kind of an example of, of GIS. And what we're going to talk about specifically, you know, after the flooding that took place in Pakistan. Um, the GIS is one of many tools that can address um, information needs that arise after a disaster. So this is not only about flooding, but the same tools can be applied to um, conflicts, to other natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, etc. My goal today, I have a few, um, but I hope to empower you with some of the data and tools that can be used in this space. And I'm an expert in disaster relief specifically, but I am an expert in geospatial. So i um, happy to sort of explore that with you today. We're going to do things. Um, first of all, geospatial thinking. I introduce those of you who are not familiar with the field. Um, that we can all benefit from this type of thinking. Um, it's just a tool to real world, and um, we do not. I want to share with you excellent sources. That they uh, they are all free. They are some of my favorite resources. So Microsoft's Planetary Computer is one, uh, and then there's also a few other sources I'll talk about. And we'll just do a quick sort of talk about how we can use that data to address needs after an event like a flood or any other event. We won't be able to go very deeply, but I just want to sort of bring awareness to these kinds of methods. So how we approach a geospatial problem, I've broken it down like this. We need to know the problem we're solving. So for example, that how to to um, select a location for a relief camp, or how to route supplies from one place for another. That's an example of a type of problem that takes place in geospatial. We need to find data that can help us get towards the answer. There's usually a step in processing the data. Of course, analyzing it actually is a method to answer it for us. And most important, I think, is to communicate whether it's through a map or an action. What do you do once you know uh, the answer to your question? And we're going to focus really on these middle pieces. Where do we find data and what are some ways we can start process and analyze them? So we'll start with the data piece. Quick guide to geospatial data resources. I'm going to talk about two types of data remotely sensed and vector data. So when I talk about remotely sensed data today, I'm talking about satellite imagery and aerial imagery. 
this, I'm sure. Um, this is satellite imagery taken before and after the flooding um, near this city, Paroa. And very familiar with looks like. And this is one of the most powerful tools we have in, because uh, we can see what is actually happening at a given time. There are a lot of organizations who who data. You might be from some here or many more that are not. A few categories. We have government organizations who provide this data and capture it at the least. Um, and then we have commercial data. Now, there are pros and cons to both. In the case of government source data, uh, it depends on the government, of course, but there's often free sources available and the long running programs. Uh, we have satellite imagery that goes back to the 80s. It's public. Um, there's actually some prior to that as well. And it is publicly available, though it's at a typically. Commercially sourced data tends to be better, depending on the can be very high resolution, less than a sem resolution. Also provide the ability to task satellites so you can pay these companies to point their satellite at a location and take photos for you. Expensive. Um, any of these companies like Maxar and they actually have fixed data if it's for humanitarian purposes or if it's in response to a specific event. So that includes Pakistan, that includes Hurricane Ivan when happening in the United States right now. It's, uh, um, it's always worth asking these companies what they're willing to provide. They have programs in place to work with the community. So a lot of data is out there. A lot of organizations are out there. Do you decide how to actually what you actually need. I'm going to draw our attention to two very popular data sources that can do a lot for us. And they come from these two organizations, NASA and the European Space Agency. They each have their own program. And it looks like this. Um, there's a program from Europe, and there's the Landsat program from the United States. And these are satellite space that take photos um, every 5 to 16 days at resolutions 10 meter, if it's Sentinel, 30 meter if it's Landsat. So, and it's free. So what this means is you can find a picture of almost anywhere on Earth that is at most two weeks old. You can compare it to photos of years and months prior. And, um, like I said, it's free. Now, the resolution, we consider that kind of low or mid resolution, but it is good enough to identify buildings. It's good enough to look at coastlines or water lines. It's good enough to identify roads. So for a course picture, this is very, very good. Um, now, there are clouds in these data. We can't control that. Um, and there's vegetation that covers the ground. We can't control that either, um, but still quite good. And this is just examples of what those data look like. Now there's one more piece of space foreign remotely sensed data I want to talk about, and that's synthetic aperture radar. So those images we were looking at are like an image you would take with your camera. It's true color, it's what we see with our eyes. Um, but there are also sensors that use radar. And the advantage of using radar is that it goes through clouds and it goes through vegetation, and we actually just get a look at the Earth. And not only that, um, depending on what bands you look at from that backscatter, we actually detect uh, surface water. So for this reason, SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar, is a very good tool to assess flooding. And I'll just show you what this looks like. This is not true color. This is not what we see with our eyes, but rather what we see when we look at different bands and color them. 
but um, the pink areas are showing some surface water. And I'll just show you another example. Again, this is obviously not true color, but these are two images, one from before the flood, one from after the flood. Um, and you can see there's sort of a dark blue area. That is surface water. You don't see it on the left side, but you see more of it on the right side. This is what SAR data can do for us. And we can use this plus the true color optical imagery to kind of put together a picture of what has happened or what the Earth looks like at a particular time. So with that said, I want to introduce how you find this. And this is where Planetary Computer comes in. Planetary Computer is a product at Microsoft. And they have this charter. They want to support sustainable decision making with the power of the cloud. Practically speaking, what they've done is they've assembled all of this Earth data into a catalog. And they, uh, they manage the ingestion, the color balancing, the organization and the hosting of the data. And then they provide us with a very easy to use catalog, which we can query, um, as well as some Python uh, environments where we can pull that data. So um, it's an amazing source. I'll actually show you really quickly what that looks like. But if you go to the Planetary Computer website, there is a place where you can sign up for their preview. Um, you'll just form, fill out a little form. And then uh, you have access to their hub, what it's called. And a hub is basically a Python notebook environment. They support a few other environments. And it will load up. And you'll have access to all of these tutorials where you can query the data, you can find images with clouds or without clouds, or that area, you can really refine those queries, and it's all Python-based, so you can write any tools or use any existing libraries to work on that data. Really, really powerful uh, if you know Python. And I'll just, I'm going to just share actual planetary computers website with you really quickly. Um, so you can get a sense of what that looks like. It's very cool. So um, this is the site here. You can look at the data catalog, all of the data that they offer. It's not all satellite imagery. There's a lot here about vegetation or elevation, etc. And um, I'll just go to Sentinel here. You can explore the data and actually choose what you want to look at. So I'm going to go somewhere in Pakistan. We'll go down south here near Karachi. And we can control. Um, there we go. So this imagery, you can see this came from a few days ago. There's clouds. Um, but what's really cool here is that you can filter and query the data. So you can look um, at specific dates uh, going back deep into the past or not so deep. You can go just a month ago, let's say the month of July. And you can see in this case that was monsoon season. So we have a lot of clouds in these images. Um, but the point being, you can query them very, very easily and sort of um, access the data. And every piece of data, say you find an image that you're interested in, um, you know, it's all linked to the hub where you ha uh, have examples of how to download the data or how to process it in the Python notebook environment. So really, really cool program that we have at Microsoft. Um, Please, I encourage you to check it out I, all the time. Now, so that's remotely sensed data. I'll talk about one more type of data that is really important, vector data. Vector data is what we represent as points, lines, and polygons. So that is things like houses, um, stores, hospitals, building footprints, 
parks. Now we're talking about polygons. Lines can be um, used to represent roads or railroads, let's say. So this kind of data really enhances the satellite imagery. We don't see we can see these things in the imagery, but we don't know what they are. And that's what vector data does for us, is it tells us what other uh, data exists in that space. So most important for vector data is always a local source. So it's people on the ground who know best their communities. And that's why, um, that's why floodlight is so important. This is crowdsourced data, a lot of it. It comes from people on the ground. This is always better than uh, these big, free, public data sets because they're often more relevant to the location, more recent, um, and actually describe what people uh, find important. So local sources of data are most important. Find the people in your community who are collecting data, who are aggregating the data, and work with them. That's always the best source. Um, there are other sources that are not as good, but are pretty reliable and can give you a good start. OpenStreetMap is one example. OpenStreetMap is kind of like the Wikipedia of mapping. It is crowdsourced information. And on there, you can find a lot of data, um, hospitals, roads, schools, parks, uh, all of that. Now, it's not always complete and it's not consistent everywhere in the world, but it's a very, very good start. And there are lots of places to get OSM data. My favorite is this website here, which is called Geofabric. And there you can go and pick your location, and they offer a nightly build of OSM, and you can just pull the data that you're looking for in a variety of formats. One more thing I'll mention is building footprints. Microsoft actually has a really interesting program around building footprints um, that is going on through Bing. And what the Bing Maps group does is they run AI on satellite imagery, and they have a model to, de to detect the building footprints, and they make all of that data available. So it is on GitHub by region, um, and a lot of it is actually Attributed to OSM, so sometimes you can get it through there. Now we don't do R. R A this can quantifying event. We can see are impacted, infer how many people live in an area, things of that nature. So footprints are super important as well. Now I'm going to move forward to some of the analytics pieces. We talked about data. You can find it um, on planetary computer or OSM or through local organizations. But um, now you, you need to do something, right? And this is sort of where the fun begins, you could say. Um, there are lots of common information needs, especially after a significant event. Visualization is perhaps the biggest one. Just having a place where people can see all of the most recent information or information related to a specific event is huge. Um, and that doesn't come from nowhere. It takes people making those visualizations, making those resources, so that everyone knows the, the most recent information, right? For flooding, there are some methods to identify flooded areas. And once we have flooded areas identified, we can look, we can do a lot of things. We can see how those areas change over time. We can quantify the impact and say uh, how much damage has been done and to who. And lastly, this data can drive decision making, right? So if we want to know where to place sites or how to give resources to those who need it the most or those who are impacted the most, then we now have some basis to work with. I will just go through one exercise where we'll 
identify flooded areas. And um, this, I think, is sort of step one to start doing the other types of analysis. We want to know, or at least guess, where where a flood has happened. So um, common tools, there are more than what's listed here, but we have ArcGIS Pro. That's what I will use um, to show you this because it's very visual. But Python works. QGIS, which is an open source software, works. There are lots of tools out there. And once you're in these software or once you're in Python, there are a whole bunch of libraries and tools to support. This is just a small subset of the tools that are available for looking at satellite imagery in ArcGIS Pro. Python has equivalents. You can always write your own. Um, it's just to say there are so many tools now that we can use to approach our problems. So if we use the flooded area example, I'm going to just walk through sort of how I would do it quickly um, so that I can move on to higher order problems like what, how to give food or resources or whatever needs to be done. So I'm going to talk about this one use case where we take that synthetic aperture radar data and we clean it up a little bit and what we're left with is a shape that describes the flooded areas. Okay, so SAR data, we got it. We have it from Planetary Computer. And um, problem is it can be very noisy, and I'll show you what I mean. So what we're going to do, we'll do a majority filter where you take lonely pixels in the image, and if they're surrounded by a different value of pixel, then we change it to that value. So that reduces some of those um, noisy pixels in the image. Then we'll do a threshold where we decide which pixels correspond to the flooded areas, which do not, and we'll basically make it binary. We'll say this corresponds to the flood and this does not, and we'll just sort of reclassify those pixels. And then last, we take that image data from a raster form to a vector form, a polygon, and we'll have a shape that describes the flooded area, and from there we can do a lot of other analyses uh, against other vector data. So we can say how many buildings are inside this area, what roads touch this area, um, does this area prevent access between two other places, things like that. So we'll just start with this area here. This is near um, this is near, near Tonsa Reef, and I'll have that written on the slide here. This is an image before the flood, and an image after the flood. I just want you to sort of pay attention to how it changes. So this is before. You can see a lot of green space, and you can see after. There's a lot of brown, and that that corresponds to newly flooded areas. When we take the SAR imagery, it looks like this. Okay, so again, I'll flip back and forth. You'll see that the pinks, the gray, kind of roughly corresponds to the brown in the true color. This is what has been detected as surface water. But you can see it's very noisy. Like, it just has grain all over the image. So what we do is we run a majority filter, and I did it through ArcGIS, but you could do it in Python. Um, and, and what that does is it takes those lonely pixels and kind of blends them with the surrounding pixels. And I, I realize the color changed, but hopefully you can see that a lot of the dots in the river area, um, now they're all black, meaning that they've been sort of erased and merged into this larger body. So these are all just steps to reduce noise, right? Next we do a threshold, and again the color changes, but basically here I'm saying uh, all the black is water, I think, and I figured out what those values are and turned them green. And lastly, we're going to take all those green areas and turn them into a polygon. So this is the same data, it's just represented a little differently. If it's not green, it's been taken out of the image, there's been some smoothing around the edges, 
And now we're left with this shape that um, is not perfect. It's not telling us exactly what's flooded. There's error involved here. But we have a pretty good place to start, right? And we have some, we are able to start quantifying this event and this change to the landscape. And I'll just show you what this looks like. This is the real image, how you would see it from an airplane or from a satellite. And then this is the same image with just all of the flooded areas extracted to the best of our, our ability. Now, there's very sophisticated ways to do this. Um, this is not a sophisticated way, but it works very, very well. And we're able to sort of move on to the next challenge, right? So if I overlay this now with vector data, we can start to really enrich the scene. I added roads here. And this is the town of Tansa Sharif, you can see in the corner there. Um, now we can see actually how this flood is impacting the region, right? So just a few things that I see, there's some flooded areas actually in the habitable area, like in town. There are some bridges. Oh, I actually see one I didn't circle. Um, some bridges. This is the Indus Highway. And... Um, you know, a lot of flooding over the road. So perhaps that's a place where access is, is compromised. Regardless, now we have uh, a way to sort of start to ask those questions. Is access compromised between different places? Which towns are impacted the most? You can imagine if we do this for more areas, we do this for the whole country, now we have a very, very good look at this situation that's occurred and we can target communities that need the most help, those that have been impacted the most, either they have the most flooding or perhaps they have the least resources to handle you know, the, the consequences of the flooding. So um, ho hopefully you can sort of see, see the idea here. Um, now that we have the flooded areas, we have a really good basis for nearly any other type of analysis that we want to do. And we can't cover them all. That's actually all, all I have to share related to this right now. Um, I really just hope that you're empowered with, with the geospatial thinking, the tools that are out there and the data that can be used. Um, we applied it briefly to a flooding scenario, which is very um, timely, but it's really this way of thinking that allows us to respond to any type of event that happens in our communities. So we'll just conclude. There are excellent sources of geospatial data if you know where to look. Many of them are free. And Planetary Computer um, is one of those sources for satellite imagery, SAR data, other types of environment data. And uh, we also have sources like OpenStreetMap and local data that comes from your communities and people on the ground who are uh, dealing with specific problems. There are rudimentary spatial analyses that can be done. We looked at how to identify flooded areas relatively quickly, um, but from there, you can go to deeper uh, response planning, and you can make apps to communicate those, those decisions, those actions, those results. Um, and lastly, you don't need to be an expert in this. These tools are accessible to everybody, and simple analyses and simple data can actually go a really long way if you're applying it to, to some sort of real world problem. So no matter what your background is, I hope that um, this put a bug in your brain and you can sort of see um, that this is really approachable if, uh, if you want it to be. So with that, I've sort of done my piece here and we have time for questions. And we have Salman and Travis in the room too who can answer a lot of them as well. Hey, thank you so much, Anna. This was a uh, really, really great. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I must have learned a lot, actually, so that was awesome. Thanks, and thank you so much. Uh, so with that, um, and by the way, Anna, if you have any links or something you want to share, you can just come up in the chat as well. I'll also share those as well. So with that, we are uh, opening up to questions. Please, uh, if you have any questions, um, uh, send them to Ali, be cool then put them, uh, Ali from Papua and Chul then put them here, uh, just to share with Anna. 
and questions could be about this. They could also be about the um, uh, the platform as well, the APIs for from the UGID platform as well. Uh, and I'm happy to answer those things as well. So great, great stuff, great presentation. Uh, so let's see. Um, I'll start reading through some of the questions from the top that I see in the chat here from Marie. Um, we didn't turn here from others. So one question, and I guess some of this maybe partly answered already, and so uh, we can maybe do a quick answer and move on. Uh, but can this data be analyzed to identify roads, rails, and other infrastructure over time? Yes, absolutely. So the roads piece is pretty easy. Um, there are actually a lot of models that exist that you can apply to, to detect bare, um, bare roads. And um, there's some tools, like one is called Maximum Likelihood Classifier. It is a pixel-based classifier where um, you identify roads from an image, and then um, based on those samples, similar uh, pixels are identified in, 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 in an image. So that's a very nice way to look for roads. Um, it's a process very similar to, to what we saw today. Now, railroad maybe a little more difficult. It's not as pronounced in satellite imagery, but there are other uh, methods that are more object based where you can sort of look for a certain texture uh, in an image and identify those areas. So all of that is doable with being side, railroads being difficult, power lines being even more difficult. Those would require maybe better imagery, but um, the method is very much the same. That's a great question. Great. Um... The next one seems to be more recommended here, perhaps. Uh, Sour false color uh, uses shark wave near infrared, um, infra shark wave infrared near infrared and red light to help identify water beyond their natural waterways, which can be represented as a strong blue color. Yep, exactly. Uh, is, yeah, okay. Is it possible to? Or mud houses using the tools made available by my. Yes. So, um, what you could do, you could write a process with Python or, or um, in ArcGIS, they also have a tool, uh, an ArcPy library that connects to their tooling. What you could do is you could um, go through each building, searching it, and if. Uh, looking at the pixels in that image and if a majority match the colors that you've identified prior, like a range of pixel values, then you can quickly iterate through all of those buildings, all of the imagery um, associated with those buildings and select the ones that match uh, the right color of the, the, the mud homes. Now there's, that's not going to be perfect, but that's, that's sort of the, simplest way I would approach it, and I think the results would be pretty good, or at least a good enough start. Great. Um, will the models tools trained on international data sets work for classification of crops, of crops in Pakistan? Um, yes, so th there are models out there for vegetation detection and identification. The problem is that um, our results are usually much better if we have some local data to validate against. So those global models are very, very good, of course. Um, but what I would encourage you to do if this was a problem that you're working on um, is see if you can get some local data that's that's labeled and do some training on that data just to really make sure that it is applicable to the landscape in Pakistan. So those international data sets are great, a great place to start. Uh, some more local data will always make that analysis stronger. So I, I recommend trying to kind of grow your own solution if you can, or at least combine the methods. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, another question I have is, are you using a speckle filter? What is the threshold you are using to calculate the before-after difference? Yep. Um, 
So no, this is more of a more of a smoothing filter, really. Um, the one that I called majority filter. Um, I, there are other types of filters out there that actually, you know, would have similar results. So you can you can select many different kinds. Um, the second question. Oh, what is the threshold? So, um, I, given the bands, um, that were combined in this, that SAR image, uh, the values, we had values, whole numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, five. I picked, uh, the lower integer values, zero, one, two, three, which, uh, and I, I believe it was zero, one, two, three, which corresponded on the optical image to be the river, um, some of those wet, muddy areas around the river, and the inundated areas in the town. So this is a case-by-case basis. You really have to look at the imagery and look at the SAR and decide what the threshold is yourself. Um, It can be a very specific number, a very specific problem. But um, in my case, it was pixel values, three or lower. It could be different depending on a different location or a different set of data you're trying to identify. So really important to actually, um, you know, experiment and try to find that threshold yourself. Just because it works in a flood in Pakistan does not mean the same exact numbers uh, will will work on a flood in Mexico or or in the United States. Okay. Uh, All right. So. Another question I have, uh, are there any low-code, no-code tools available as part of the product for those who are not technically inclined? Perhaps a group of filters that can be applied to solve one particular issue. So um, for that, for a low-code, no-code solution, I would look at a desktop GIS software. So ArcGIS Pro or QGIS. And what you can do, you can use Planetary computer to download imagery. So you can just download, let's say, 10 images, and you can bring it into a a program like ArcGIS Pro. And once you're in that environment, you do not need to code. Um, There are buttons for everything. There are models, visual models you can write that say, you know, use this tool. And when you're done, use this tool. And when you're done, use this tool. And um, no code needed if you don't want to. And it's very visual. So you'll actually Actually, be able to click on the map, click on the data, look at tables, that sort of thing. So um, there is actually a lot you can do. You can do everything I did today with no code um, using those those software. Right, thank you. Uh, another question here: How easy is it to integrate the Microsoft platform with Anaconda or similar environments to run uh, deep learning stuff? Oh my gosh, it is. Really easy. That is a great question. So you saw, I, I showed you the Python notebook, which is in Azure in this, you know, kind of browser hub, but you could very easily, um, use a local Python environment, Anaconda. You can use a Python environment in Azure. All of those tools work across any Python environment you want. So you are not limited to the notebook. And um, you can actually go a lot further without the notebook because um, if you're doing, if you're in the Python notebook, there are going to be sort of thresholds to uh, compute and space and how much you can download. All of that, you will run into limitations at some point. If you go uh, into your own Python environment locally or on the cloud uh, and just use the libraries that Planetary Computer has written, then you can, you know, you can run any model you want at any scale that you can build for. So that's a really good question. If you are technically inclined, if you know Python, all of these tools can be used uh, in your own environment, how you like to use it. And you can, of course, combine it with any other Python code or APIs or projects that you have going on. Very, very powerful. Great. Um, That's great to hear. And and let's see. Uh, are all these tools open source? What are the advantages between using the Microsoft platform versus G E E? G E E. I don't know what G E E is. I'm not sure G E E is either, but everything I showed today is open source. 
with the exception of ArcGIS, which is a desktop software. Uh, there is an open source version, version which is QGIS. Um, and yeah, you can always contribute to QGIS, and of course, um, yeah. So nearly everything was open source. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. There's so many questions, Anna. <laughs> uh, I hope you're not getting too tired of those. Um, no, I love it. Great. Uh, so can this tool use both geospatial images and vector data at the same time for in-depth analysis? Absolutely. There are ways to... Um, so sometimes you have to move between raster and vector representations for some tools to work most optimally. But yes, you can have this data alongside each other and you can um, you can basically have them talk to each other. So you can say, give me all of the points that intersect this uh, this zone in the image, or you know, give me all of the roads within a hundred meters of uh, a value, a pixel of this value. You can do things like that. Sometimes it's easier to do uh, to compare raster data to raster, vector to vector. But um, it's pretty easy to to translate between the two. So yes, these tools are pretty flexible uh, with regard to the vector and raster data. Um, I think a few more questions. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to classify different buildings and areas using different colors to uniquely identify them? Yes, it is. But you will need more information than the image provides. So um, at this resolution, many buildings look kind of the same. So, you know, I can't tell if it's a school or a post office or a hospital, usually, based on the satellite imagery alone. Now, if you had some other data, like you had OpenStreetMap data or um, some other data source that enhanced this information, then you can very easily color them as you wish. You can say, all my hospitals are red, all my schools are blue, this neighborhood is orange, whatever you need. But you need that semantic data because the satellite imagery alone will usually not be able to provide it. How often is the Bing team updating the building footprint? Is it possible to see where buildings disappeared after the flood? That is a great question. Um, I'm not sure how often it's updated. I, I probably not very often. Uh, it's not going to be as frequent as the satellite imagery that we talked about. So, um, it's a good starting point if you don't want to go identify your own buildings. However, um, their methodology is, is open. There are other building footprint methods out there that's very similar to what we showed today. So um, if you wanted to see a building before and after event, I would actually recommend going to Sentinel data, going to Landsat data, and identifying the buildings before and after. That will be far more telling because you can have control over the dates. Unfortunately, with that Bing data, uh, it will not be so. You won't have that same control. Thank you. Uh, what is usually the accuracy percentage when it comes to thresholding based on pixel data? Um, there are a lot of papers out there on this. Uh, I, I don't know specifically, but um, I don't I don't know actually as a number. So this is sort of where we get into deep remote sensing science to actually, uh, we would need some ground truth to validate against to really know the accuracy. But uh, less than ten percent, I would feel comfortable saying that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, how can a layman learn about data acquisition and data analytics using Python? That's an excellent question. Um, to be honest, all of the information we need to learn about GIS, data analytics, Python. Uh, it's all online. I mean, we live in an amazing time 
where YouTube can teach us these things. Stack Overflow, there are tutorials. Uh, all of those resources are free. I really believe that a lay person can use those resources and become very, very powerful. Uh, you do not need school necessarily. You do not need experience or training necessarily. I believe everything can be learned online, um, especially with Python. It's one of the most popular languages in the world. Um, so many resources out there. Great, thank you. Uh, have you used ground truth to validate mm -hmm. flooding area calculations? So I have not, not in what I showed today. Um, I have done that in the past. So um, this is really the right way to do things, a scientific way to do things. You know, you're going to make a model using imagery, but you want to know how accurate is it really. And that's where you need someone on the ground or maybe drone imagery can be used to do that validation. And um, with that, you're actually able to show, to demonstrate and quantify your model, how good it is. So we did not do that today, uh, but that would absolutely make everything far more accurate far more useful and far far more scientific and rigorous. So I love the comment. Ground truth validation is absolutely needed if you want to be very precise. I think I'm taking me one more question because uh, we're running out of time <laughs> and it's really been engaging for us already. Uh, would topology data help predicting flood impact downstream, elevation data, elevation level? Oh, Yes. So elevation data is, um, we call them DEMs, digital elevation models. And these show us per pixel on a per pixel basis what our elevation is above sea level. And this can be very good at um, predicting where flooding could occur in the future because low laying areas are more susceptible to flooding, right? So um, this is absolutely an analysis that's possible. Um, there's a lot of science, a lot of research around this area. The thing is, we want a very, very accurate, uh, not accurate, but high resolution elevation model in order for this to work. So um, the stuff that's free, 30 meter resolution from Landsat, uh, is probably not good enough to really get a good analysis there. That is where uh, you need something a little more high, high resolution, which can be expensive um, if we can't find it for free or open source. So the idea is very good. The idea works, but um, but you need good data to really uh, realize it. Yeah, and I think uh, I'll end that here and tie it back to our first thing, the hackathon that we did. Anna was part of uh, the team as well as was Travis. And in that, we did use mm -hmm. uh, DAM data, digital elevation model, model data. And the idea was that um, the platform that we saw with uh, with uh, park floods, with flood light, this is where we're like, okay, how can we add value? Because Pakistan's terrain goes from the highest mountains, you know, down to ocean. And so terrain is a big part of, of, of the flood impact. And so showing that in a 3D uh, environment with elevation, uh, the idea, the hope was that would add a bit more informational value to, to for relief, relief privatization. So uh, this is great, question, and I think there's a lot more questions coming in, and uh, I really appreciate the engagement. Uh, you know, please feel free to uh, reach out to me at least, uh, and I'd be happy to. Uh, if there are any questions that I have, I can try to, uh, you know, maybe reach out to Anna. We have Travis as well on the call. Uh, uh, these, I've shared the LinkedIn's, both Anna's, Travis's, and myself. Um, so if there's something that you need to reach out about, uh, about questions on any topics, please feel free. And with that, thank you so much, uh, Ali in particular, uh, for hosting this event for us in such a, such a short amount of time, such a quick time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I appreciate, uh, everyone that was able to make it. And for those that weren't able to make it, this session has been recorded and so you can share that out as well. Uh, again, thank you very much, Anna, for this amazing presentation. Thank you all for your engagement. I'm very humbled to to meet you and get to talk about this with you all. So thank you so much for for joining, especially those of you who are in Pakistan, where it is uh, 10 p.m. now. Thank you again.
See you, everyone. Recording stopped. Thanks, Ali. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, Anand, for your time. So, have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, you too. Bye-bye.